Logan Doctors and welcome back to my channel. In this video we are continuing on with our series on parasites, going over the amoebas that are tested on USMLE Step 1. This includes the microbiology, pathology, and pharmacology. My timestamps and sources will be listed down below, so without further ado, grab some coffee, get comfortable, and let's get started. So we are in the phyla amoeba zone, aka Sarcodina, who fall here on my overall list of parasites. So let's go over a typical amoebic life cycle, which consists of two forms the cyst and trophozoite. Cysts are the dormant form and they're either double or triple walled and they're highly resistant to environmental stresses, allowing them to exist outside their host. Now trophozoite is the mobile form, which allows for reproduction and feeding and they are highly adaptable to their environment. Now if a trophozoite is presented with an environment that it cannot adapt to, like changes in pH, overcrowding, lack of food, it will undergo encystation or encyst and become its cyst dormant form. It basically secretes its thick wall around itself to protect itself, enabling it to survive longer. Likewise, when environmental conditions allow and become favorable, the cyst form will undergo existation, and the trophozoids inside will escape through the central pore and break free, allowing for mobility, reproduction, and feeding. This is the typical structure of an amoebic trophozoite, starting off with their pseudopodia, which is their means of motility. It's made up of their ecto and endoplasm, so the trophozoite will extend out part of its cell membrane and then force cytoplasm into it, allowing for locomotion in that direction. The other important structure to note is the contractile vacuole. Now, most of these trophozoites exist in water that is typically hypotonic in comparison to their intracellular environment. As we know, if a cell is placed in a hypotonic solution, water will freely diffuse intracellularly, typically causing a cell to swell and ultimately lyse. The contractile vacuole is the structure that allows for that not to happen. So the vacuole will collect all of that water that is freely diffusing into the cell, allows for ionic exchange, and ensures that the intracellular environment remains stable regardless of the hypotonicity of its environment. And now for the names of our step one amoebas. Starting off with Balamuthia mandriaris, Acanthamoeba polyphaga, Megleria fowleri, and Entamoeba histolytica using the mnemonic of their first letters, Bane. Not only Bane from Batman, but also they are the bane of our existence as doctors because they're extremely hard to diagnose and even harder to treat. For this lecture, we are focusing on the purple, which are our CNS amoebas. Now we all know the phrase in medicine, we think if we hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. Well guys, these are your zebras. Because these parasites are typically not on your list of differentials when somebody presents with meningitis or encephalitis. So let's go over them one by one. Starting off with Balamuthia, who is a soil-dwelling, free-living amoeba that much is not known about. That being said, there aren't really any specific risk factors. There's no rhyme or reason why one person is infected and another isn't. However, there's a growing body of evidence showing patients who undergo whole organ transplants and subsequent immunosuppression are, are at risk, as there was an outbreak in 2016. I will leave that NCBI article listed down below. His route of entry can be through open wounds or it through inhalation into the lower respiratory tract and water is possible. Remember, not a lot is known about Balamuthia. For the epidemiology, there have been 109 known cases, according to NCBI, in North America with Southwest U.S. having the highest prevalence. The mortality rate is greater than 98%. There are only two or three known survivors. Morphologically, as we've gone over, for the cyst form, it will encyst in unfavorable conditions. and They're all spherical with a central pore or osteo. So when conditions allow, it will exist and the trophozoite form will escape through that central osteole. Again, this is the stage of feeding and replication and it's the true amoebic form. In this case, both forms are infectious and both can be found in human tissue on biopsy. The pathology associated with Balamuthia is granulomatous amoebic encephalitis. For the pathogenesis, upon exposure, it will use the blood to spread to the CNS where it fe feeds on its favorite food, which is actually the microvascular endothelia, aka the blood-brain barrier. It's also able to phagocytize tissue and nerves. In a competent patient, the immune response will be a type 4 hypersensitivity, hence the name granulomatous, and this is, of course, an attempt to wall off the invader. In an immune-compromised patient, which has a whole organ transplant undergoing immunosuppression, you will be very perivascular cuffing, because remember, it's feeding on the endothelia. The earliest symptoms for clinical presentation can take weeks to months to appear and will begin with a slow onset headache, nausea, and nuchal rigidity, though typical signs of meningitis or encephalitis. The patient may also present with focal paralysis or brainstem cranial nerve symptoms like Bell's palsy, dysphagia, or dy diplopia. 
skin lesions are possible, but they will mimic bacterial lesions, and your clue was that they will not go away, aka not responsive to antibiotics. If left untreated, the late stage will lead to hallucinations, convulsion, loss of consciousness, and ultimately death. Death is typically due to brain swelling from the immune response or pressure lesions and necrosis. Diagnosis is typically empirical because your number one clue is that the patient will not respond to antibiotics. On MRI, you can appreciate multiple ring-enhancing lesions with extensive necrosis and edema. This is not specific. Many bugs can cause ring-enhancing lesions. If a biopsy is able to be performed, you will appreciate cysts or trophozoites in the brain tissue, which again is not specific because it can be any of these three amoebas. Though technically the gold standard, if able to be performed, is on culture. And that culture will have to be done on mammalian or primate liver or vascular endothelial cells because Balamuthia does not feed on bacteria. For treatment and prognosis, the prognosis is grim. As I've already said, the mortality rate is greater than 98% within weeks of, from onset of symptoms. If caught early enough, the drug of choice is Impavito, aka Miltifosine, which is a cytochrome C oxidase inhibitor. This drug was approved by the CDC in 2013 for treatment of leishmania, PAM, and this, GAE. The problem with this drug is that most hospitals don't carry it because it carries a hefty price tag. One full course of treatment is 58,000 US dollars. Next up is Acanthamoeba polyphaga, who is a freshwater free-living amoeba. Now she has two associated pathologies and likewise the risk factors are both exposure to fresh water and contact lenses being exposed to fresh water or tap water. The route of entry for GAE again is through open wounds or through the nose to the lower respiratory tract and for keratitis of course the risk factor is contact lens uses or improper usage of contact lenses. The epidemiology for keratitis is that there's 105 known cases in North America however this disease is found worldwide. Morphologically is the exact same as Bellamuthia with the cyst form found in unfavorable conditions and is spherical with its central pore, aka osteol. When conditions allow, the trophozoite will escape through that central pore and will feed and replicate. And again, both of these forms are the infectious stages for humans and can be found in human tissue on biopsy. Acanthamoeba keratitis. This is the much more pertinent pathology for acanthamoeba. The pathogenesis starts off with contact lens contamination, typically with tap water, because this amoeba can survive in the space between the lens and the cornea where it divides and feeds on corneal tissue and vasculature, and our inflammatory response mainly contributes to the damage seen. Clinical presentation will start off with unilateral eye pain, which progressively worsens rather quickly. Other symptoms are photosensitivity, redness, and extensive tearing in the affected eye. The person may also complain of a foreign body sensation, so the feeling like something's in their eye, and blurred vision that rapidly progresses. Diagnosis will be done by eye exam where you will see evidence of corneal degeneration. The epithelial will be intact, however, it will appear, appear mottled under fluorescence. On fundoscopy, you may appreciate thickened corneal nerves with ragged borders that radiate outwards from the pupil. And this is termed radio, radial keratoneuritis. In advanced disease, you may even be able to appreciate a ring inf infiltrate or abscess, and this can be seen with the naked eye. Confirmation the gold standard is on corneal scraping, where the gold standard is PCR. You have to include differential stains like KOH and calcophore. For treatment and prognosis, the prognosis is quite grim as it usually progresses to blindness in more than 98% of cases within weeks from onset of symptoms. If treatment is an option, it's dual therapy with topical anti-amoebics like biguanized chlorhexidine and oral ketoconazole. Now this is the second amoeba on our list that can cause granulomatous amoebic encephalopathy. And the reason I have granulomatous in quotation marks is because typically this is only seen in a compromised patient. So patients with HIV AIDS or those who are immunosuppressed. The pathogenesis is fulminant GAE, which will actually mimic nigrariasis, which I'm going over next. So the clinical presentation in a competent patient would be the exact same as it would for Bellamuthia, with the early symptoms being a slow onset headache, nausea and vomiting, as well as focal paralysis or brainstem symptoms like Bell's palsy dysphagia and diplopia, with the late stage occurring much quicker with hallucinations, convulsions, loss of consciousness, and death. Diagnosis is the exact same as Bellamuthia, with your number one clue being non-responsive to antibiotics. In MRI, you will see the exact same thing, multiple ring-enhancing lesions with extensive necrosis and edema. And on biopsy, you will see the exact same with tissue trophozoites and cysts. So the confirmation would be on PCR. Treatment and prognosis, again, exact same as Bellamuthia, with miltifosine being the drug of choice. And just as a last reminder, this drug is not carried by most hospitals, as a full course of treatment is 58,000 US dollars.
ponds are host to a deadly amoeba that claimed the life of a local teenager last year. Whose daughter was dead the minute she jumped in the water. She just didn't know it. We are looking into a deadly amoeba infection. Now for the true brain-eating amoeba, Nanglaria fowleri. She is a thermophilic, free-living amoeba, meaning she thrives in high temperatures, specifically in warm, fresh waters. Risk factors would be lakes and hot springs, as well as activities that would expose you to said bodies of water, like windsurfing or just straight up swimming. Route of entry is via the nose, so Nigleria goes through your nose. She invades the olfactory epithelia and follows it through the cribriform plate up to the frontal lobe. For the epidemiology, since 1960, there have been 138 known cases in North America with greater than 95% mortality. Only four people have survived this. For the morphology, pay close attention. We of course have the cyst form, because the trophozoids will insist in cold temperatures, in this case less than 50 degrees Fahrenheit, she can survive in the environment for months. Her trophozoite form will escape through that central pore when the environment allows, aka greater than 50 degrees Fahrenheit. This of course is her true amoebic form, morphologically described as a large nucleus with a surrounding halo. Now unlike the first suit, Naglaria has a flagellated form, yet another evolutionarily adaptation allowing her to survive. The flagellated form exists when she's exposed to hypotonicity, so this is typically the form you will find in fresh water. This form can be inhaled while swimming, and she will then transform into the trophozoite form, and this transformation only takes hours. You will not see the flagellated form in human tissue, but you will see it on a CSF sample. Primary amoebic meningoencephalitis, aka nigleriasis. Starting off with the pathogenesis, upon exposure to fresh water and nasal epithelia, she will transform to her trophozoite form if necessary. Remember, this is a stage of feeding and replication, so she's able to phagocytize tissues and nerves. So she follows the olfactory nerve through the cripiform plate to the frontal lobe where she feeds on our astrocytes. The clinical presentation for this is very different than the first two that we've spoken about. The number one most important thing is the patient's past medical history which will be contact with warm, fresh water within the last seven days. If you don't know this fact, you will not think of Nigleria. The patient will complain of a new onset, frontal headache, with or without a nausea, because remember, she's eaten up our olfactory nerve. And this headache can come on as quickly as one day after exposure to water. Those symptoms will quickly pro progress into the meningitis triad, being nuchal rigidity, photophobia, and fever. Quote unquote late stage, which is really only a few days after onset of symptoms. The most commonly reported symptom is hallucinations, convulsions, ultimately loss of consciousness, and ultimately death. For diagnosis, an MRI can be pretty telling if you know what to look for, as you will see extensive edema and necrosis localized to the frontal lobes. On spinal tap, you can see the flagellate or trophozoite form and it will be a turbid draw, meaning it will be cloudy. However, it will obviously be culture negative because it's not bacterial. So that being said, a culture is typically not done because there's just not enough time. If you suspect it and want to confirm it, it will be done on non-nutrient agar coated with E. coli, which will then be cleared in linear lines because Nigleria does feed on bacteria. And the technical gold standard test is the flagellation test, where you would add a drop of distilled water at 42 degrees to the culture plate and observe flagellation, because remember, her flagellated form exists in hypotonicity. For treatment and prognosis, as I've said, it's very grim. The mortality rate is more than 95% within 7 to 12 days from onset of symptoms. And there are only, as of 2018, four known survivors. Since step one is sort of behind the times, technically the drug of choice is amphotericin B, even though there's been little success with it, and it's actually an antifungal with a lengthy side effect profile and high toxicity risk. If you haven't seen my antifungals video, I will link it up in the eye right now. In reality, so in your actual clinical practice, there has been success in one case with therapeutic-induced hypothermia. And finally, as I've stated, miltifosine is currently the actual drug of choice, as in 2013 it was approved by the CDC for treatment of primary amoebic meningoencephalitis. So for all three of these pathogens, but specifically for Nigleria, I'm just going to stress the importance of taking a proper past medical history from your patient. As you've seen above, it presents just like meningitis, which we would typically associate as bacterial. All of your cultures are going to come back negative and your patient is not going to respond to antibiotic therapy. So in that situation, you guys, remember your zebras, especially Nigleria. Ask the patient if they've come into contact with fresh water, especially if you're in the southern or western parts of the United States where it's always warm. Nigleria can infect anyone. The prognosis 100% depends 
on a speedy diagnosis. And by speedy, I mean one to two days after onset of symptoms before she's able to eat her way so far as she causes permanent brain defects or paralysis. Hoofbeats are not always horses, sometimes it is zebras. If you keep this in mind, you can save this patient's life. Okay, doctor, I know that was pretty morbid, but you made it to the end. Thank you so much for watching. I'm gonna leave a bunch of NCBI articles listed down below in the description for those of you interested in learning more especially about research being done to improve diagnostics. Stay tuned to my channel. Make sure you smash that huge thumbs up just down below. Good luck studying, and I, of course, will see you on the next one.